Behold the Chevy Montana. This is the absolutely adorable small pickup truck designed primarily for the South American market. It's going to be built in Brazil, and we're probably never going to see it in the United States. Now, a lot of folks have guessed that maybe that's because of its manufacturing location and the so-called chicken tax, which taxes imported light trucks. Some folks have also assumed that maybe it's because it only has a 133 horsepower, 1.2 liter, three cylinder turbocharged engine under the hood, or even the fact that it's going to be front wheel drive only. But when you really scratch the surface, None of those things is the likely reason that we won't see this here, because they could always move production to Mexico, import it to South America, import it to the United States, and that would be just fine. But its size, that's a little bit less fine, because this is actually fairly small for a pickup truck in North America, and this problem has nothing to do with customer preferences and everything to do with CAFE. That's what we call the corporate average fuel economy standard, or CAFE. Olé. So what is the corporate average fuel economy standard and what does it have to do with small trucks not existing in this country? Well, first let's talk about how small the Montana is. It's 185 inches long. That means that it's actually not as small as Toyota's first pickup truck sold in North America. That was teeny tiny at right around 169, 170 inches long, considerably smaller than a Ford Maverick. I remember when the Ford Maverick launched and people were shouting from the rooftops, oh my God, this is the first truly small pickup truck we've had in America in a long time. Um, no, not really. Because if you think a Dodge Durango or a Ford Explorer are compact, then, you know, hey, sure, why not? The Maverick is a compact truck as well. At 199.7 inches long, essentially 200 inches long, and just about as wide as a Durango or an Explorer, I mean, they're not compact either. So, uh, I mean, unless you think they're compact, then, you know, again, sure, you do you. But there's a reason the Maverick is the size that it is. If the Maverick was any smaller, the fuel economy would have to be crazy high, so high that it might not even be achievable. If you've ever wondered why the Maverick has a standard hybrid system, this is why. Let's dive into the corporate average fuel economy standard stuff. It started in 1975. That's when CAFE was created. If you're like me, you were not alive in 1975 for the start of CAFE, nor for what caused it, the 1973 oil embargo. That really freaked America out, and it made people realize, hey, we need to have more efficient cars because then we'll use less gasoline, we'll have to buy less imported oil, Therefore, we have energy independence. For some reason, a lot of folks associate CAFE with an electric vehicle movement. That's not what was going on in 1975. This original legislation created fuel economy targets for passenger cars and for light trucks, and these are in separate buckets. Some folks confuse this with the gas guzzler tax. That's something a little bit different because that is customer facing. If you buy a vehicle whose fuel economy is too low, then you'll see on the window sticker that there's a gas guzzler tax applied to that vehicle. CAFE is a little bit more insidious to some, but it's more discreet to others because it happens on the manufacturer side of things. The manufacturer gets penalized for producing and selling vehicles that don't meet minimum fuel economy standards. Obviously, they pass those fees on to you in the cost of the vehicle, but it's wrapped into that MSRP quite discreetly. Interestingly, CAFE had a reasonable impact on average fuel economy immediately. Of course, there were also some lingering effects from that oil embargo so that probably had something to do with it. And it also coincided with the rise in imported vehicles, which were generally much more efficient than domestically produced vehicles. By 1985, fuel economy improvements had either started to level off or had actually receded in some categories. That's probably not too surprising because by the mid-1980s, we had other things to worry about collectively as a nation, like impending doom from nuclear wars, things like that. And of course, gasoline got a lot cheaper. And in the 1990s, there was a time where it was incredibly inexpensive. So not too many people were that worried about fuel economy until things had moved on a little bit further into the George W. Bush administration. And at this point in time, there was a national collective push to improve fuel economy because people were worried about something different than electrification at the time. They were worried again about energy independence. And that's what happened with the law that George W. Bush ended up signing. The Energy Independence and Security Act of 2007 was widely supported by both parties and it fit right in with a lot of G.W. Bush's talking points, which was his 20 in 10 challenge or 
the challenge to cut gasoline use in the U.S. by 20% in 10 years. That's a really aggressive goal. And he realized that one of the ways you had to get there was to incentivize companies, or I guess penalize companies really, for achieving certain MPG goals, or in this case, not achieving them. And those goals were really ratcheted up in that Energy Independence and Security Act of 2007. As with many pieces of federal legislation, it took a while for the rulemaking process to be done, but model year 2011 was the first time these rules were implemented. And the big change that happened for that 2011 model year was the new footprint scheme for giving you fuel economy targets for vehicles. It wasn't just one fuel economy target for a truck, one fuel economy target for a car. That could have made sense, and that might have incentivized smaller trucks and, I don't know, what it would do to cars, probably smaller cars too. But that's not what we got. Instead, we got a footprint-based model where they take the wheelbase and the track, you multiply it, and then based on the square footage of the vehicle in that dimension, you get a specific MPG target. This resulted in kind of a weird loophole and a bit of a gotcha. Within the footprint sliding scale, you don't necessarily have to make your truck more efficient. You could make your truck larger and thereby meet a lower fuel economy target. On the other hand, you can't make your truck too small because then the fuel economy requirement might be so high that it's unachievable. Now let's digress for a moment and talk about what I mean by unachievable. I don't mean that the car company couldn't sell that truck or that car in America, but they will have to pay a fine. And obviously there's going to be a point where that doesn't make financial sense. So the current fine in this scheme is about $150 for every one MPG that the vehicle misses that target by. So if you're trying to sell a truck and it misses the target by one MPG, you have to pay $150 for every truck that misses that target. Logically, that increases the cost of that truck by 150 bucks. But what if your truck misses that target by 10 MPG? Then you're paying an awful lot. If you're paying $1,500 or $2,000 extra for a $60 or $70,000 truck, that's probably not a big deal. But Americans think that small always means cheaper. So for a baby truck, if you want it to be $15,000 or $20,000, then increasing that price tag by 1500 bucks that's a big deal. That brings us along to this lovely diagram. This is the fuel economy requirement chart for light trucks in America. You can see that there is a particular floor down there, but the floor does change a little bit as we move from year to year. The top dotted line on this chart is 2026. That's the most stringent fuel economy standard that we know exists at the moment. You'll notice something here. As the truck gets bigger, the fuel economy requirement drops down and down and down and down. But as the truck gets smaller, the fuel economy target goes up to Prius-like numbers, just about 55 MPG there. And here's how that tracks out for vehicles that we know are currently on sale. So for model year 2022, something the size of an F-150 or a Ram 1500 or a Silverado or a Tundra, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, they need to achieve 26 miles per gallon. And that's every half ton truck sold in North America. Now you might be thinking 26 miles per gallon sounds pretty good, but that's not 26 miles per gallon on the window sticker. That's 26 miles per gallon calculated the way that we did way back in 2007, because that's when this law was last most recently radically changed. And back then, we calculated fuel economy pretty differently. Highway fuel economy, about 48 miles an hour. No high-speed runs, no air conditioning used, etc. So what's on your window sticker is much more realistic. What is on this calculation and how vehicles have to comply, a lot less realistic. So 26 miles per gallon for a truck might sound incredible, in real world terms, this is a truck with a current EPA window sticker of, I don't know, maybe 21, 22 MPG, which is basically every American half ton truck in America right now. Now, if you shrink that truck down to say Ford Ranger sized, then on this compliance scheme, it's about 32 miles per gallon. Now, even if you adjust for some of that reality in fuel economy testing, that's still gonna be a little tricky for a Ranger. The Tacoma definitely isn't gonna be in the party here. Now, 26, 28 miles per gallon real world fuel economy could translate into 32 MPG on this chart. That's probably why we find that lower displacement turbocharger in GM's new midsize trucks. This is also why we do not find small trucks in America. Have you ever wondered why we don't have a regular cab Ranger? Why we don't have a tiny cab short bed Tacoma? This is exactly why. Because if you shrink the format of the vehicle, you shrink that wheelbase in, 
then you have to achieve a much higher and less achievable fuel economy target. If we're talking about a pickup truck as small as this Montana, it would need to get about 40 MPG in 2022, going all the way up to 53 MPG in just four years by 2026. That's going to be really difficult, if not absolutely impossible, if it did not have a plug-in hybrid drivetrain or if it wasn't a battery electric vehicle. So the easy answer is just don't bring it to America. Again, if you ever wondered why the Maverick has a standard hybrid drivetrain, this is exactly it. Because the Maverick, as far as compliance goes, logically, is just fine. It's just fine because we have that standard hybrid system that sells in good volume, and because it's actually not that much smaller on this footprint measurement scale than the Ford Ranger. It's actually only a little bit smaller. And the result is that for CAFE compliance, the Maverick only has to average about one mile per gallon better in the CAFE calculations, which are complicated and subject for a whole other video, than a Ford Ranger. So that's not really too difficult to achieve. And that is also logically why we see Ford pushing so heavily for the Maverick and why they're producing that hybrid model in huge volumes. Because the more trucks they build there, the better their entire truck portfolio's fuel economy looks. Because the light truck category and the passenger car category are combined in their own separate things. And then manufacturers can move credits across with a credit trading scheme. So if you've ever wondered why Toyota doesn't really seem to care too much about their truck's poor fuel economy, that's because Toyota can trade credits from all the Priuses and hybrids and other things that they sell on the passenger car side. And there is a scheme by which they can migrate those over and then cover the losses for their relatively inefficient truck lineup. And the Toyota trucks are really pretty inefficient when it comes to that. I suspect this topic is gonna to create a lot of hot commentary down there in the comment section. So let's address a few things before I sign off here. The first thing is that the cafe fuel economy numbers are about 20% higher than real world numbers. Critical, critical thing to keep in mind. So if we're talking about a requirement for 50 miles per gallon on these charts, in reality, that's a 40 mile per gallon vehicle. So you get 45, 40 miles per gallon, that vehicle is likely just fine on the 50 mile per gallon cafe compliance, just because of the way these numbers are done. Now, in case you're wondering, yes, EVs do factor into this mix a bit because they're also getting cafe calculated here, but there's no fine because they don't have to meet a specific efficiency requirement for an electric vehicle. Instead, because those numbers are generally pretty large up there by 100 MPGE, they will actually help the manufacturer's average fuel economy calculations. So depending on how many F-150 Lightnings Ford sells, they can sell enough that that would actually enable them to sell maybe more or less efficient 5 liter V8 F-150s. This is also why we see manufacturers like Tesla make a reasonable amount of money off of selling cafe credits because they don't need any. They're a completely zero emissions manufacturer, so they can actually sell every credit that they generate to a company like Stellantis that needs them. And by the latest numbers, it looks like Stellantis pays over $100 million of fines every year for non-compliance in the US. Now, that may sound like a lot, but when you look at how many Jeep, Dodge, Chrysler, Ram, et cetera, vehicles that they sell in the United States, this is really only a few hundred bucks per vehicle, maybe actually less than a few hundred dollars, maybe just about a hundred dollars or so. Luxury car companies are the ones that are actually more likely to be paying cafe fines. BMW, Mercedes, Audi, they almost always pay cafe fines, Porsche, et cetera definitely pays cafe fines. And in these segments, it's not a problem because you add $500, even $1,000 to the cost of your quarter million dollar Mercedes. This is absolutely not a problem. But again, with smaller trucks like the Montana and a lot of smaller vehicles, smaller truck-like vehicles that people might want, that is absolutely a problem. So this Christmas or next Thanksgiving, when you're around the table and someone is asking you, why don't they bring back small trucks to America? You can uh, raise your cup and just say, it's all about the cafe.